It is really a tremendous pleasure to introduce Terry Frischman, who is with us this evening. Um, it's really exciting when we get to uh, have with us just an outstanding local New York City entrepreneur, and uh, Terry certainly is that. We were connected, actually, through our extended uh, network through uh, our colleagues at Kiva Zip. Um, that you've heard a little bit about and that you'll hear more about. So we're so delighted to, to make that connection. Um, Terry has a tremendous background and experience um, studying for her MBA several years ago at Columbia, spending a bit of time at Kraft Foods, speaking to any number of different large organizations and companies and businesses that you've heard of, um, really largely, although not exclusively, in the food space. Um, and one of the things I think that I was really struck about um, in my conversations with Terry and also from her website, um, which you'll have a chance to visit, QNS, is she's really, a, she's a teacher and an educator as well as a consultant and an active volunteer and someone who regularly gives back in the community to food organizations, to women entrepreneurial organizations, and any number of others. So um, you have before you somebody who I think will be very interesting, very helpful, and is going to provide you with holistic information that I think I hope we'll give you uh, more questions to answer um, than anything else when you leave this room. But so without further ado, Terry, we're so pleased to have Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited to help you. I'm, I'm hoping that tonight I'll spark ideas in your minds and help you think in a different way about what you're already doing. I, I appreciate those of you who took the time to email me your answers to things like what are the biggest issues you face, what do you see as your strengths while you'll be successful, and so on. Those questions were intended to help you think about some key things before you, you know, as you're moving forward in your businesses, the risks you see. Um, I picked some of them in terms of issues and included them in this uh, presentation tonight. So what I would like to do, I did indicate that I wanted to go around and have you each do maximum one minute pitch. Before we do that, I thought what I would set up is the why. And I'm going to explain why. <laughs> why the why? Okay. So it's like I'm doing this right. Okay. So today's topic is creating a social business plan. Who here has actually written a business plan before? Okay, great. So about seven of you have done business plans. So a social business plan is a little different than a regular business plan in that it involves social entrepreneurship. And this is a definition that was um, from a business plan handout from the Harvard Business School about pursuing opportunities to create pattern-breaking social change, regardless of the resources you currently control. And I know a lot of you mentioned in your write-ups that you sent to me, thank you, about limited resources. So remember this, without resources you currently control, you still can make a difference. And we're gonna talk about this tonight whether you're a nonprofit, a for-profit, or for or public sector. So I know from what Becca told me beforehand that you know some of you are not for profit or nonprofit, others are you are for profit. Um, you still can be a social entrepreneur. And this part about pattern breaking social change is where I want to start. So what does that mean? It means that you're solving a problem. And everyone here should really be thinking about what is the problem that you're solving. So in creating a social business plan, the why is not just the problem, but it's the causes behind the problem. There's some things you can control, and there's some things you can't control. But at least by understanding it, it allows you start to start thinking creatively about it. The opportunity is what are you going to do about it? And in the thinking about the opportunity, no matter whether you're in the concept stage, you're already in market, or you're you know, a large corporation, it, you still want to always be thinking about what, have other, what are others doing to help solve this problem? Um, what's solvable? Break it into doable little steps. So when you're saying what's been tried, you have different thoughts that come from that, at least in my mind. One is uh, doing like a competitive analysis or research of some sort, due diligence, checking out what others have done, go online, talk to people, and so on. But also, this is an opportunity to partner with others, okay? If you have limited resources, if there's other people who are like-minded, they can help you move forward on your agenda, which is a larger agenda. Is this making sense? Okay, cool. So, you also want to think about results. And these are going to be tangible, and a little bit I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what kind of impact do you want to have? And as you're thinking about 
about in one minute little presentation that you're about to give. I want you to think about what I've just said. What problem are you solving? Where do you see the opportunities? How can you solve it? And what kind of impact do you want to do? And that's in the classic format still of the who, what, why, when, where, and how. But the why, when it comes to a social business plan, is what's most important. Does that make sense? Because the why is what makes it different than another business plan, which let's say it's for profit, has a very different intention. And you might set it up differently. And for those of you who don't want to write a business plan, raise your hand if you're not intending to write a business plan, just so I sort of know what you're, so you all are, good. So as you're working on them, think about the why maybe more than you did before. Okay. So for your one minute elevator pitch, you all know about an elevator pitch. As quickly as possible, because there's a lot of content and it's really good to say it quickly, say your name, say what is your why, what are you, what's your problem solution? And, and then place it in context of your business briefly. A who, what, why, when, where, and how all together. All right? And um, I'm just going to go around in sequence. So it's it's Yun Wang? Yeah, Jun Wang. Jun Wang. Oh, okay, so you first. We're just going to quickly, and remember, there's a lot of people in the room, so we're going to keep it to one minute. Um, mine could be really short. I didn't really do a detail like that, but it's fixed for you. Um, so my, hi, my name is Chung Wen. I'm also known as Taiga Wen. Um, my company is geared to entrepreneurs um, that need help with their businesses. I actually consult with other small entrepreneurs that are in the food sector or in the tech se sector and they're um, building their businesses from scratch, so small startups. And what I do is I set up events and that's pretty much it. <laughs> I'm, I have a practice, I pitch, so I have to That's practice. okay. Um, but that's a great point, too, about yeah. practicing. Practicing for everything you do. It's part of your process of getting better and better. And part of running any business, too, is learning how to do it better. What, you, what you've done before, how are your numbers pacing, and so forth. So you did a good job. Thank right. you so much. Hi. Oh, okay. uh, my name is Victoria Kavirna, and uh, I own the company, uh, Indicator Lock Company. We manufacture and sell privacy lock with special additional feature. Why? Because of the privacy in uh, public uh, places. The real need privacy, if it's one place, is this public restroom. And uh, our uh, locks, I mean, our company was, uh, it's a WB certified company. It was founded uh, three years ago, based on personal experience, being in the restroom, feeling somebody pulling, knocking, like uh, stuck in the door and uh, thinking of something, how we can change the world. Great, thank you. My name is Danelle Eddington. My company's name is Good Goodies. We're a vegan big goods company. And um, what we do is we spin traditional desserts into vegan delicious desserts. And the reason why I'm doing this is because we want people to be able to eat healthier and also to be able to afford to eat healthier. I didn't get here early enough to practice my pitch, so I'll meet you there. <laughs> I feel the same way. Very good. Thank you. In the back. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Darrell Rich, and I am the founder of Joshua's House Incorporated. Uh, I started my organization because youth in my community needed a safe space to express their talents and their interests. Uh, even more, they needed a safe space to dream. Um, and I wanted to create that space where their dreams could come alive in the midst of the hopelessness they saw around them. Um, with that, Joshua's House began in 2007 with a backpack and a school supply giveaway. And we evolved quite quickly into a mentoring program. And um, today we offer, um, we really focus on four areas, education, mentoring, community service, and health and wellness programs um, for youth uh, ages eight through 18. Great, thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Shunette Henley. My firm is Papillon Financial. And almost every day, I meet entrepreneurial women and executive women who are very successful in what they do as a career, but don't have a very successful relationship with their money. And what I do 
is as co-partner in my firm, we provide financial strategies to help help entrepreneurs and, and women specifically um, really have a, a strong strategy for building wealth. And we take a behavioral approach by using a temperament tool to help them understand themselves and therefore understand their relationship with their money so that they can build a successful strategy. Very nice. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> well done. Awesome. Um, so my name is Dana Wilson. I am the other co-founder of Capion Financial. And like Chanette was saying, we really focus on the person, we focus on who you are, and really understanding and helping people understand their money mindset. Our big, our focus on our company is really through education. We do all of the brokerage services as far as retirement planning, individual consulting, helping people roll over their previous retirement plans. But our big picture is the temperament tool that Chanette is focusing, that Chanette spoke about. Um, in our Wealth Education Program, P, which stands for Proactively Educating and Acquiring Knowledge. So our goal is to use that temperament tool to help people understand who they are with their money, to continue to push them forward and help them understand what it means to build generational wealth. Great, thank you very much. That's a great compliment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good evening, Baffers. Now, my cohort. Now you know this one because I've been refining it, so. Once again, good evening. My name is Tara Nihisi. I am the owner-operator of African Frames, and African Frames is a mashup of art, history, and a hint of heritage. We are currently transitioning our e-commerce business to the mobile and tablet platform in order to, I'm gonna turn around, sorry, <laughs> widen the appeal of framing digital art and reduce our carbon footprint by no longer sourcing and importing wood from South Africa. The why is right now I'm creating a traveling exhibit where I would like to feature Native American or Mara Indian art um, properly, um, excuse me, in my African frames. I think it'd be a great compliment and I wanted to travel all over the nation highlighting the original peoples of this land because heritage is very important. So, thank you very much. And I had one other line that I normally have on the end of this. Let us frame your precious moments at AfricanFrames.com. <laughs> um, your mentor, Michelle, your mentor, and Michelle Wilson, hi. Hey, uh, my name is Amy. Uh, most of you know already I'm a maker of herbal teas called Dasana, and I just launched about a month ago in New York City. Um, I come from a background in asset management, and about two years ago I decided to leave and study herbalism um, because um, ultimately what helped my acne was plants. And um, I took them in their whole form and made teas out of them. So I got really excited about this and um, started looking for other herbal products out there. Um, but they were like stale herbal tea bags or um, alcohol extracts. Um, so I wanted to make something really pure and real um, and traditional following um, what um, herbalists have been doing for years and that is just using whole plant material, um, sometimes I use mushrooms as well, um, to create seasonally appropriate um, beverages that help nourish us according to the seasons. Um, so I am really passionate about this and um, really want to do it well because I ultimately really care about my customers and want to do it in a very transparent, honest, and accessible way for people. Um, so I just. Really, my top priority is creating a really good product and um, slowly educating people about it as well. Oh, sorry. I thought we were, I was like, what's next? Uh, okay. Hi, I am Marcy Thompson. I'm Jenny Turner Hall, and we have an organization called Studio B. Um, we've been producing theatrical events in New Jersey for about five years, and we know two things are true art builds community, and community builds the arts. But in our Maplewood South Orange community, which is filled with artists and creative professionals, we don't have a physical space to make that happen. Now, all of us need a place to connect, collaborate, and cross-pollinate ideas. Also, a place to imagine such an idea and make that idea a reality. So what's the why here? The reason we're doing this is because we would like to create a cultural center in Maplewood and South Orange that connects people at every stage of life to the arts, education, and community engagement. Our business is a co-working space for artists and entrepreneurs, a space for events, and a space for classes and programming. We want to create a place where artists and audiences connect and where new ideas can take flight. The end. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>
end scene. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great having the two of you do it together. Next time, next week, don't do it with the laptop. Oh, we were, there's nothing on that screen. We're just, <laughs> so just <laughs> the yeah. But it was great. Memorize. Practice without it because you guys are great. You really, you can do it. You know your stuff. We can do it. Yes. You can do it. We can do it. All right, good. Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Giselle Aboma. I'm the owner of Surfing Queen. And uh, Surfing Queen is a lifestyle brand that combines my African heritage and the surfing culture. So uh, we provide surfing and uh, surfing active wear um, that promotes a sport, uh, action sport as well. So um, why I founded this company? Because of my passion for um, surfing and um, the fact that I was thinking when surfing queens become more successful, since I'm from uh, Africa in the Congo, I would like for the women in the Congo to start making the bags with African fabrics and the dresses so they can give a better life uh, for the family and the children. So that's one of my dreams as well. So what makes Surfing Queen so unique is that um, Surfing Queen reaches to women of color, uh, promoting action sport as well. And uh, that's something that my competitors fail to do. So. Um, I'm working hard on making things happen. Good luck. That's Thank great. You. All right. I'm going to stand. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Fantasia Painter. I am the Executive Director of Alternative Education. Alternative Education is a nonprofit that provides training, support, and tools for teachers and direct services to Native American students on reservations across the country. It's our goal to raise the graduation rate of Native American students and to equip them to pursue higher education. I started this organization because I myself am from a reservation. I'm a first generation student. Uh, I graduated from Columbia University in 2013, and I'll be starting my PhD at UC Berkeley. Um, I got there because I was given the support and the encouragement to pursue higher education, and I believe that we can with your help, encourage more students to follow the same path. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm late. Um, I'm Anna Lee Tan. I'm the executive director of what we call Global Biotics Initiative. Biotics is a relatively new field. It began with the first organ transplantation in the country in 1954. Meanwhile, it progressed. So we decided to have this organization to raise awareness and hobby kind of understanding of some of the issues that some of you are familiar with, like human organ trafficking, an important subset of human trafficking, but usually neglected, although it happens everywhere, and it involves surgeons and the impact of uh, reproductive technologies on population. We have egg markets. Young people can sell their markets. We have people who are infertile. They can buy what we call the gametes, sperm and eggs. We create, the, they create the embryo in vitro and then they implant it. So is there anything wrong with people being 70? And becoming mothers. Guess what? It's possible. The oldest mother in the world is 72. So we are raising awareness of that. Are there any consequences of selling your eggs? And there might be health and some others. Okay, surrogacy and so on. And we also work on uh, regenerative medicine. What is hype? What is reason for hope? And that's what I'm doing. We have a consultancy with the United Nations, we have an office there, we're interested in working with them. That's all. That's great, thank you so much. And I hope you can help us to raise funds, money. <laughs> That's what we need, <laughs> more money. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an amazing group. I'm, I'm very impressed by each of your passions and, and your problem solutions that you're starting to work towards, and congratulations. 
So we're going to um, continue on some of the topics. Um, the focus of tonight, as stated earlier, is creating a social business. So we talked about how the why is really important. But it's also important to understand why do you need a business plan, right? What do you think? Just real quickly, what do you, what do you think? So I'm sorry, I didn't even see you. I'm biting. Okay. <laughs> um, well, before we even think about the audience that we want to put it out to, like uh, certain investors, I think a business plan helps you understand um, the, the map for your business. Exactly. So you actually talked about two of the reasons. One is, a, uh, is possibly to raise capital, which is money, which uh, also for those of you who are in a not-for-profit or a non-profit, could be in terms of sponsors, grants, and so forth, partners. And um, the other mention was a roadmap. Um, what I'm going to do, because even with that, a lot of people don't really think through what it means to write a business plan. There's actually another reason to write a business plan, too, and, there, and it depends on what you want. Uh, but it can also be to bring partners in and people that are part of your management team. So it's a document in both words and numbers that can help you achieve what you want, or at least help you better understand. It might also cause you to decide not to do what you're doing or to change what you're doing. And it's so much better to do that when you're in the writing stage than later. So what is this slide supposed to represent, the idea that you've got choices? Um, I like to think of a business plan as, let's say, as something that you have so many choices when you start a business or you're in a business and you can grow your business that you need to sort of assess what's right for you, OK? So in a way, going to California, you have a lot of choices. You could fly, you can take a train, you could drive, you could hitchhike. OK, those are just some of them. You could take a motorcycle and so on. So each of these has different implications, right? Some are faster than others. Some cost more than others. Some um, you know, have a different experience. Even within each of these, you have different experiences. When you drive, are you going to drive nonstop and take turns? Are you going to be stopping along the way at really fine hotels or B&Bs? Or are you crashing at friends? If you're crashing at friends, did you call them in advance or email them or text them or let them know you're going to come? Because if you arrive there and they're not there, where do you stay? What do you do? So a whole business plan helps you on so many levels. It helps you understand and make choices about cost, about how quickly you're going to do things, your timing. It helps make choices on where are you, you know, how do you want to do things along the way so that you can better plan? And that's the whole point of the roadmap, is to better plan what your needs are, what your financial needs are. Because if, for example, it's going to cost you a certain amount for each thing, you need to make sure you have enough for that plus some extra. But if you haven't planned properly, you're going to end up short. And in fact, one of the top reasons why businesses fail is lack of capital. Okay? So um, that's why this is helpful. Another thing that's really important as you're thinking about a business plan is really where are you headed, all right? And one of the things we talked about already is the why, problem solution, trying to solve something and what kind of impact that you want to have. But you also need to think about what are the steps, you're, the major steps you're going to take to get there. And a good way to start is thinking about your goals and objectives. What are you trying to accomplish, all right? And one of the biggest issues when people are thinking about things is that they don't properly plan, and they don't think through things. So I'm going to give you a set of tools. Ha has everyone here seen SMART? Raise your hand if you have. OK, so just a couple of you have, so that's good. So being SMART is an acronym for the letters S-M-A-R-T. It's having specific things that you want to achieve. So this goes back to the what. What do you want to make happen? All right, one of the biggest issues, I, there's so many issues in business, but one of the biggest issues is a lot of times people don't know what they want. When you know what you want, you can make it happen because you can break it down into doable steps. Even if it seems overwhelming, if you are able to break it down, it can be simplified in a way that each step is not so overwhelming and then you can move forward. Being measurable, this is critical too. You need to think about what's the impact, the dollars, the numbers you know, percentages depending on what you're thinking of and what are the outcomes. So even if you go back to that image I showed you of your choices of going by plane, going by train, going by bus, going by car, hitchhiking, or whatever method you want to use, that affects your experience too. There's so many layers to what it means in that planning and it's the same thing as you're setting your goals and objectives. 
you also want to have some kind of action with your goals and objectives. So you need to also determine who is going to do it. What are they going to do it by? What are they specifically going to do? And I'm going to talk about this again when we get to the who. You also need things to be realistic, your goals and objectives. Okay? I am, uh, one of my pre prior positions was international sales manager for Cerebus part time. And in that role, um, as a salesperson, you tend to be optimistic. You tend to believe always that um, things are going to happen. And you tend, therefore, to make them happen, I hope, because of that enthusiasm and that tenacity and whatnot and that positive attitude. But in business, one of the reasons many businesses don't succeed is because they're over-optimistic. So on one hand, it's great to be optimistic, but you also have to be realistic. You also have to say, what can you really do? And you need to, um, because cash flow is one of the biggest issues in business, and from your issues, that was something that sort of came out, you need to be very realistic about what you can afford to do and not. So part of this planning about being achievable is also having money available and then setting priorities. So in your businesses, have you all been working on thinking about your goals and objectives, and then putting them, grouping them together, hopefully into themes, and then sorting them based on priorities so the most important things are the one you focus on first. In sales, there's something called like A, Bs, and Cs. Has anyone ever heard that terminology? It's, and it's, it's also for managing business. The A things are the things that are critical that you have to do. The B things are things you really want to do, and the C things can wait. The C things can be administrative things, whereas the A things might be you know, meeting deadlines, for example, all right? But when you have C things, C things can become A if you leave them too long. So let's say you don't pay bills. That can become an A. Does this make sense? So as you're setting realistic things, you also need to be setting priorities and staying on top of things. The time frames, therefore, also become important. So as you're thinking about what is it that you need to do, how are you going to, like when I said earlier about what impact you have with a social business plan, this in a sense is the impact of what your goals and objectives are, and so forth. Okay, does everyone feel comfortable? Yeah. Yes, you said Sarah Betts. You're talking about the restaurant on the Upper East Side? Uh, Sarah Betts has a, uh, many restaurants, and they also have a line of products. Okay. And um, so one of my, I, I worked with that. They were my first client like 20 something years ago. And uh, my most recent position with them was in sales, though I've done a lot of other things for them. So it was for all their food products. Yeah. Award-winning, Oprah's favorite. <laughs> yes. Are we going to come back to some of these, like, realistic, for example? Well, here's what I'm going so, to give to you. Um, before the evening is out, um, you'll each be looking through these, but I'll just pass around. What I did is I created some simple homework assignments. Uh, the first one is actually for you to pick five SMART goals for yourselves. And this is not for you to do tonight, but it's going to be given to you tonight for you to do uh, in whatever time frame is appropriate, according to Becca. Um, I think that everyone should have goals and objectives. And part of my, I have a lot of philosophy in business, and one of my themes of philosophy is about how to move forward. Because I'm very action-oriented, and what I do, I juggle a lot. So how do I do it? I have this belief that you always put a stake in the ground with what you know, and then you, you have to start somewhere and then you keep moving forward. And the key is that you move forward, even if it's not directly forward. So in setting goals and objectives, it allows you to keep checking things off and constantly be moving forward as long as you know where you're going. And that's where this next slide comes into play, which is about a mission, all right? Who here has actually written a mission statement? Good, about half of you, that's great. Yes. Right, you guys are together. Yes. <laughs> um, so, what do you think a mission statement? Why do you have those of you who did a mission statement? Why do you why do you think it's important? It knows what you want. Okay, helps to um, focus you on your why. Right. Yes. It it really becomes the kind of like the bedrock or foundation of where you are going. You know, um, from your infancy stages, all of the growth stages, it's really like where you come back to when you're wondering where you go and what you continue to maintain as you go forward. I love the way you're describing it. It's, well, the reason I really love it, yeah, team, team. The, the reason I really love it is I never thought of it as the bedrock. I always thought of it as the sky. 
I always thought of it as the vision and what's over me and that large umbrella. But I love the way you're thinking about it too, because it's the roots that go into the ground. And, and it's the foundation and springboard for everything, and it's for all your choices. So it's a really beautiful way to also think about it, and I thank you for sharing I mean, that. That's the first time I thought yeah. I like that, so. Yeah, no, but I like it. I like to spark it. in different ways, so that's, I like that a lot. Because what it says is, it is true that, first of all, it's something you want to be. So normally, a mission isn't something you're at today. I've seen a lot of missions written, and I don't really think that like I met with a client earlier this week um, and they had worked with a team to do mission statement and I didn't realize that and then I asked him what his mission was and when he, I shouldn't have this on tape, whoops, uh, you want, no one knows who he is. So when, <laughs> when he talked about it, <laughs> when he talked about it, I said that's not a mission, that's philosophy. And I think that, so what I'm going to do is try and help you understand a little bit more about what is a mission, all right? Um, it's something that you strive towards, so once again, you can't get there right away, and you may never get there, but it's something that is your lighthouse once again, that you're going towards, and that your choices that you make influence, are influenced by your mission, all right? So if some of you want to do volunteer you know, donations or whatever along the way in your business, you're going to pick things that make sense for your mission because you can't do everything. Does that make sense? That's a good way of thinking about it. Um, and in my opinion, too, your values should be part of your mission, and that's and, and your overarching purpose, which goes back to the social clause. All right. So, as a mission, uh, and, and this is just a simple, overly simplistic way, is something that's not attainable. You strive for it. So, when President Kennedy first wanted to land on the moon, that sounded unbelievable. If no one had broken you know, the barrier of being able to travel away from Earth and extend into space, to then say, we're going to do that. To me, that helps you say it's something that appears to be unattainable. Would you all agree if someone said for you to do that when it hadn't been done before? It's, it's almost overwhelming, but it's also visionary, and it's also something that's really amazing. Now, I'm going to bring it down to Earth a little bit. <laughs> okay. So uh, we already, one of the reasons why I also, besides the fact that it's that springboard, it's that foundation, and it's also the sky, and it's where you're headed with the lighthouse, um, it also allows you to take a smaller idea and make it bigger. And that, to me, is part of what makes this really special, okay? Um, and it also gives you consistent focus. So like I said a few moments ago, when you're trying to make a decision about things, you look back to your mission. So I said as the example, if it's like there's so many places of people that want you to partner with or invest with or um, time that's going to take you know for your business to be part of something you think back is this consistent with my mission and if it is then you set priorities and you go back to those smart goals is it realistic and attainable for what you want to do in your business given your limited time and resources is this making sense good okay so I'm going to give you an example so one of my clients is Sylvia's restaurant um, in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And but didn't they close down? No, they didn't close down. Mm -hmm. So they were rarely, and then they... They're not closed. They have multiple buildings yeah. and um, yeah. and uh, doing fine. Thank you very much. Oh. OK. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> Sylvia's is doing great. <laughs> Sylvia's <laughs> restaurant, <laughs> clean as soul food. Uh, so what happened is, when I first went to Sylvia's many years ago on behalf of another client, <laughs> Sylvia, she said, what do you love to do? So one or two of you mentioned the word passion. And she wanted to know what my passion was. I said, I love launching businesses. And she said, my son, Van, has been wanting to package our barbecue sauce. People keep coming in and saying it's really good. Nothing wrong with that. But in my opinion, that's what this next slide is. Uh, he wanted to, it's a limited idea. He wanted to package the bottle restaurant, bottle the restaurant barbecue sauce for customer takeout. Nothing wrong with that. From their restaurant, which at the time was Harlem based, soul food, and around 35 years. Okay? So, how do you take an idea that's a good idea and make it into a better idea, a bigger idea? So, first of all, for everyone here, if you haven't already done this, you want to think about both internally and externally. And that's a good way of thinking of the world, all right? Internally, what do you value? What's important to you? Externally, what's going on in the marketplace? What are the trends that are relevant, all right? So for them, we talked about, for Sylvia, Sylvia was, at the time, 
seriously at the time the largest employer in Harlem, and she was extremely proud of that. And she cared deeply about family and community and religion. And so the importance of her family and what became her extended family, her concern for the African American community and her desire to help them, but also to build a legacy for her family. Like today, I think there's like five or six generations working together. Um, which, well, that have worked together. Um, her desire to be a role model also to help others, okay? Feel good about themselves and achieve their dreams. So you look at this and you say, what does this have to do with barbecue sauce? Right, okay. Just wait a moment. All right, now let's look externally. Externally, what are relevant trends? And then this is also one of my life philosophies, is how can you leverage your strengths? How can you leverage opportunities, okay? So what are the trends and how can we leverage them in a meaningful way? So first off, these were kind of shocking to have to voice, but there were a few successful companies that were African-American owned, okay? Um, no national food lines were made by and for African-Americans. Also shocking when you think about the percentage of population. Soul food, which I, I loved calling it soul food, but I actually fought with the family about calling it soul food because there was a concern at that time that soul food might be perceived negatively. So once again, you have to think about customer perceptions and other things. Had in my opinion, what is soul food? Okay, well at the time, soul food was, the concern was is soul foods considered like chitterlings and things that might not be broadly appealing. To me, soul food is comfort food. Soul food is food from the soul, okay? So soul food in this case is like fried chicken, which it's collard greens, it's rice and peas, it's beans, it's, it's ribs, things like that. And soul food is other things too, like cornbread. You know, it's a southern style of cuisine. It's not fast food. It can be, it can but be. it's not it's not it's intended not. to be. It's 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 comfort food that's shared with loved ones and family and it comes from the heart. Okay? And it had, in my opinion, tremendous growth potential. Um, it wasn't actually marketed. There were okay, another big trend is ethnic foods. Ethnic foods are also and still are rapidly growing. So, interestingly, there's at that time one of the fastest growing segments in the industry. But this part was really cool too, that there was crossover potential. Because now when we're looking externally, if you look at Goya and at Hebrew National, Goya was targeted towards the Hispanic market, but had a crossover in supermarkets where everyone else was also purchasing them. And Hebrew National, which was targeted to be you know, a Jewish brand, really had tremendous crossover as well in mass market. So the idea is that you could create something that could help and be experienced by others and not just a smaller group. This is going to tie in later too when we talk about how to make money in business, <laughs> all right? Okay, so this concept of what's going on out there and then what's going on in there. And on your homework assignment, you're going to see number two is you're each going to work on your own mission statements, even those of you who already have them. And you want, I would love you to write down a list of values, like what do you really value that's relevant to your business? And then what's going on in the world? What are the trends that you care deeply about that are relevant that might influence your choices? So now what I'm going to do is in a very light way, take this all back to that limited idea of we want to bottle our barbecue sauce. And what we developed was, first of all, the company had a trademark, so we trademarked it. And we also trademarked a tagline. So for each of everyone here, you need to register your name and own it. We were talking about that before class started. Um, so Sylvia's Restaurant, the queen of soul food, that's our positioning. Queen represents really high quality, the best, and soul food is what we're about. So for everyone here, you need to know what are you about. We'll be the soul food gold standard, okay? So we're saying gold standard of soul food. That doesn't mean we're a Michelin five-star brand, but it means that it's a quality line. An international market leader. So at that time, they were just, you know, one restaurant, but they are known somewhat internationally. And this is really the part that I felt was the mission. Make soul food as mainstream as the top three cuisines in the country, Italian, Chinese, or Mexican. So that's a stretch. That's the striving for something. Because what that says is, you know, we all know about Italian food, Chinese food, and Mexican food. But as was asked, what is soul food? So to get it to be there, what do we need to do? So once you do this, then you start thinking back to SMART. What are your goals and objectives? How are you going to accomplish your mission? What's the who, what, why, when, where, and how? Okay? So, 
In creating a social business plan, those questions are key. I'm going to delve a little bit more now into the who. All right? I like that. I wasn't there. The who. All right, whatever. Uh, so, um, as I said before about thinking internally and thinking externally, it's a good way of thinking. In, out, up, down, like different ways of breaking things and ideas apart. Internally, the who would be you, it'd be your team, the who is like where you're producing, that's like part of a who or a what, okay? Externally, it could be other people you bring in, people that benefit, okay? Your network, your mentors, your partners, your distribution channels, and then there's gonna be like the, I think it's this next slide, like the board of, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so you need to think about, in terms of the who, you need to think about, this is the, one of the questions I emailed to everyone, why will you succeed? Why will you, why will your business succeed? They may be different reasons, okay? What expertise is missing? So part of doing your plan helps you see what you know, what you don't know. What you don't know, then you go and figure it out, or you get help to figure it out. And in terms of what you do in your business, there's things you're really great at, and there are other things you're maybe not as great at, and you have a choice. Just like we went back before to the plane, the bus, the train, the hitchhiking, or whatever. Your choices are, do you take the time to learn how to do it? Or do you bring in others to help you? And when you bring in others to help you, you also have choices. Do you bring in others to help you as a partner, as a full-time employee, as a part-time employee, as a freelancer, as a consultant, as, you know, blah, 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 all right? You have choices of how to fill out your team to get that expertise you need. And you need to think about how are you gonna get it. So, another way, um, in terms of your who, is your management, it's all your employees and freelancers, but you also could do board of directors and advisors. And I heard earlier tonight when Becca was talking, it was through the board of advisors, it was through networks and connections that different people came here tonight and are helping the foundation. And that is, life. That's what happens. You should think about your networks. You should think about who you know. You should think about what can you leverage in your life, in your business, and combine them together even though your life should be separate. You need to draw some lines. Um, you still have those opportunities to create something bigger and better. And partnerships. I can't emphasize partnerships enough. Many of you in your emails to me indicated that you're looking for help with different things and having strong partners who are like-minded, okay? Remember the part, like-minded partners to help you. They share your vision, perhaps. Maybe they share a somewhat similar mission. Maybe they share that social cause, that problem you want to solve. Yes? How do you define what you mean by partnerships? Okay, so let's let's talk about your business. Um, you were in, was it in New Jersey, creating arts, a space for arts, you had said? Mm -hmm. Okay. so. Partners that are really likely are, well, why don't you tell me, people that you can work with who can help you achieve what you want. So clearly all the artists in the area want to support this concept. Right. All right? And you but have, are they someone that you bring in as part of your business, or are they your customers? I mean, it's such a, it's such a broad idea. A partner could be it can be someone who works for you. It could be someone who you serve. It could be someone who's Okay. So in this make. situation, I was not saying the who as your customer and your target audience as the partner. Uh -huh. To me, the customer audience is extremely important. Your target, I'm sorry, your target audience who is your customer, whether it's business to business, business to consumer, or you know, it's, it's a social cause, so it's the people who are in need as a result of that. Um, that's not really necessarily your partner in my mind. The partner really more so are the people that, or businesses, or corporations, organizations, it could be, for profits or not, it could be um, individuals, uh, it could be someone like-minded who, for example, let's say it's a cause for dogs and there's someone who is known to, is a celebrity who cares deeply about some issue your dog has and they have the same issue for their dog, they might become a partner on board and help to promote your issue. Do you see what I'm saying? Your social cause. What about maybe like a small philharmonic or, you know, in your area? that you partner with to produce a performance. Exactly. I mean, I have well, a lot of ideas about what partnerships are for us, but right. this is just what the concept was. I thinking about specifically uh, Good. someone who shared part of your business. It's people who, okay, so on one hand, you can have a partner who is a legal partner, all right? Just like when you get legally married, you can have a legal partner in your business, which is like getting married, so you want to do due diligence and make sure that this is someone you want to 
continue to work with longer term, and that is an official partner of your business. And they can have different shares. It could be it could be instead of yes, it could be different types of legal organizations, legal entities that allow you to have someone that is a legal partner with you. But then you also have partners who are people like the Philharmonic that was suggested that might agree to work with you. You could have partners with the media, you know, people who help to promote you, that you work together. For example, I'll be teaching a course on food entrepreneurship for 12 weeks or whatever. And Edible Magazine is an official partner. They're going to be coming in. One of their um, writers will be in each class and then writing it up and putting some features out there on some of the people in the course. So they are a media partner versus. So it might be helpful to explain that a partner is somebody who helps you advance your mission. That's great. And it might be a leader. That's great. And the thing is, it doesn't only have to be mission related. You can have partners for other reasons. So for example, let's say you're a store and there's another business in the neighborhood with you. You might have a mission that's all this, but you might do something for each other. Like let's say a lot of you are in clothing. So raise your hand if you're in clothing. Okay, the three of you, four of you, whatever, who are in clothing. Um, maybe there's a restaurant near you. And what you do is you get the birthdays of everyone who comes in, you know, not the year, just the month and the date. And then you have a postcard that you send to everyone or you email everyone with a free dessert at the, a restaurant that's in your neighborhood. The restaurant benefits because it's on the birthday or the month of the birthday if someone comes in and they're reaching a new audience, but you benefit because it's a goodwill. That partner has probably nothing to do with your mission, but it's a different type of partnership. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So, um, Dorel, Joshua's house. Um, you mentioned this issue. Would you like to read your issue to everybody? Cultivating a board of directors and locating space to host our programs and services. Okay, so many of you talked about having limited resources but wanting to achieve certain things. So what we were just talking about, about partners, creating a board of directors. So you want people who are like-minded. You want to find people who, sometimes it's, you know what the expression, you know, the busiest people are the ones who you can always ask to do more. All right, it's generally true. Um, so if you look at board of directors potentially from other businesses in Harlem, for sure, there's people who are like-minded who will share their mission, all right? And my advice would be, there's like, I just got something this, years ago, I did something with them, the Harlem Community Center or something. If you email me, I will, I, I have it on my desk somewhere. I will look them up, but Harlem Community Council, I think it was. No. Um, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, I interrupted. I was, okay. Oh. Just for clarity's sake, I am based out of New Jersey. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so it's But you know what? People who are on these, if they share the same feeling, they go, there are no people. So you all know the term six degrees of separation? Mm -hmm. I'm a strong believer that you can find the people that you want. Number one, you need to know what you want. Then what you need to do is think about who do you know who might be similar, even though they don't fit exactly, or know people who are similar. And you start to put it out and you start to ask people. And then they remember things. And you, you don't want to make someone feel uncomfortable where there's the expectation they have to tell you something on the spot. But what happens is these ideas are similar and then things sort of connect. And before you know it, someone will say, oh, I think this person, and then that person might not be right, but they'll say, oh, but this person will be great. And it happens. So you need to be willing to ask around, but ask around in places that are more likely to be correct for what you want. Um, and in terms of a space to host programs, uh, the key thing is to ask. I know that sounds so simple and obvious, but I, and also you want to ask in a way that people feel good that they're helping you and that you're really appreciative of it because there's so many people asking all the time for everything. So the key is that you, you target spaces that are right and then you try to work with them because I do this for events I run sometimes where like, I, I, I've also, to the point of a partnership, like the school, the Institute of Culinary Education, has formed a partnership with me where historically they gave me an entire floor annually to run an event for the New York Women's Culinary Alliance, which is called My Story and Advice, A Night With, and I bring in different luminaries and interview them and we do a fundraiser. And then they also provide people, and, and it's a partnership that we've created because it's mutually beneficial for multiple reasons. Usually a partnership has benefits you want to think about 
how does it tie back in a meaningful way? Okay. So, um, in terms of managing the who, this is a, I know um, the two of you are together, and the two of you are together. And uh, this is also for everyone, though, in terms of managers, employees, partners, and so on. You need to think about having clearly defined roles and responsibilities. You don't want two people above the same skill set. You ideally want to be separating out who is responsible for different things, whether it's operations, whether it's sales, whether it's finance, whether it's HR, whether it's marketing, whatever. So this is really important, and this is a great way to maintain friendships, <laughs> because it moves from personal to professional. It's really clear. Okay. Accountability goes back to SMART. Remember when we talked about accountability? Numbers, dollars, timing, percentages. By setting up immediately with your partners, and even just for yourself, what is it you're trying to accomplish? This makes things really strong and very doable. And also, one of the big issues a lot of people have in business is that they're not really sure what to do. So what this does is start to set that frame for, framework for what you're supposed to do. And then the third part is communication. So, I like to always split things up. So to me, communication could be um, something that is uh, formal or informal. So formal might be you say every week on Monday morning or Friday at such, such and such a time, we're going to sit down, whether it's Skype or in person or phone, and we're going to talk about how are things doing versus last week. How are we pacing versus what we said we were going to do? What's new news that we need to share with each other? Those kinds of questions. All right, because sometimes when you learn something, you have to change what you're doing. Maybe you expected certain things to happen, but due to external things like bad weather or whatever, you, you know, things didn't happen. The shipment didn't come in with, you know, the clothes are being held up in uh, customs, that kind of thing. So the other type of communication is informal, where you're regularly keeping up. Communication is really key. And you want to make sure that in your businesses, the people you work with, you set up a structure that follows, this is, in my opinion, a great way to set up a structure to allow you to work well together in order to achieve your goals and objectives, in order to continue on pursuit towards your mission, in order to make sure that things move forward, that bills are paid, that you don't have too many people hired that aren't going to be working because you don't have the business coming in, or you didn't raise the the grants that you thought you were. You know, you need to just keep in touch with each other to make sure. So this is a really good structure so that people don't like yell at each other <laughs> and businesses fold. Okay. Um, Victoria, would you like to share this one? Uh, I need the team of talented people but do not have the means to pay the compensation they deserve. Okay. So this is also a classic. Once again, limited financial resources. But one thing that's really important is a team of talented people, not everyone is motivated by money, even in a for-profit business. People are motivated by many things. And so if you can learn to tap into some of those other things, a lot of times people are willing to work for a lot less because there's other benefits they're getting. So even something like having someone do photography or art for you or logo, Someone might even do it at, for no cost, and I'm not saying I recommend this because everyone should get paid, but as part of having a portfolio, all right, and that's to their advantage. Uh, people sometimes are motivated by power, so having a great title, even though they're not being paid as much. People are motivated by challenges, depending on who they are, so that's another way to motivate and get someone to join your, um, it doesn't have to be someone full-time too. So you could create a team of talented players who are part-time, and that might really suit someone. You, by being um, also very grateful and thankful and appreciative, it's another way to get people willing to do things. Um, also, if it's really a social cause, and there's really meaning behind the cause, people might be more willing to support it and recognize and accept that they're taking less. But that the other option, too, is that they have an opportunity in the future to make more. So it's not that forever it's going to be they can't get the compensation they deserve, but it's worth really willing to commit because there's maybe a bigger um, positive at the end, something like that. So what I'm saying is don't walk away to, from these people if you feel it's because you don't have enough money. You've been looking for these people. I don't know where to tap. Wherever I, I was talking to people, everybody's like, oh, look at the, I mean, in our company, I mean, nobody believes enough. To Your firm, Victoria, was the, oh no, it was the locks. Okay. So um, I think 
Well, the way I read this, it says you need the team, but the issues seem to be you don't have the compensation. So what you're really saying is you don't know how to get the team. Is that what I'm hearing? But to get to this team, yes. Okay. So in order to get the team, remember earlier I talked about clearly defined roles and responsibilities. So first of all, it's saying what are the things you're great at that you know you can handle, and then what are the things you want to delegate, and then what are the things that you don't know how to handle and you want someone. So delegating can be things that are repetitive tasks. Repetitive tasks are a good thing to give to someone else at a lower wage because ideally you want to be focusing on more biz dev, building your business, developing your business, making sure that the numbers are working. So in terms of finding a team, one, you need to know what do you want, what are the skill sets you need, and then you can go out and try and find those people through different means. There's headhunters, there's networking, there's job postings, there's lots of ways. Okay. Um, so the what is your story, your product and service and all this, is how do you describe the what, okay? So, your target customer also is really important, and that's part of the who, but it's also what are you doing. The customer experience ties back to it, okay? What are you offering, you know, the where sort of goes elsewhere, but it's all stuff you're thinking about as you're talking about the what, because where it's available influences the what, all right? Because if, for example, you have a what that's available in the spa, it's gonna be very different than that same product. You're gonna package it differently, let's say it's a beautiful soap, than if it's gonna be you know, in another type of environment that doesn't have the same feeling as a spa. So your what is influenced by all these things. One of the key things I often talk about is meaningful point of difference. Um, it's really why is someone going to use your services or come to your organization or do this versus all the other choices out there. Does this make sense? So everyone here, I didn't put it on your homework list, but I want to add it. Okay, I want you all to think about what is your meaningful point of difference. Why are people going to come to your business, use your services, want to support you? What's the reason versus all the other choices out there? Because there are a lot of choices. Okay. Sorry, guys. The when, um, I put on there also a Gantt chart just to give you an idea of one approach to a timetable. Everyone should have a timetable. And I, I will be honest, when I listen to your one minutes, very rarely did I really get a sense of any kind of timetable of what you're going to do or any kind of financials. We're going to spend a little time talking about financials. And those are part of your business. You know, the what it might include, you know, we're an early stage. So if you're saying you're a lifestyle brand, I mean, I have no idea of, you know, do you have products yet? Are you in the marketplace? Are you internationally selling? You know, those kinds of things, like in your what, depending on who you're pitching to. So, for example, when you mentioned about the business plan, you did mention about the audience being important, and that's really true. So when you're pitching that one minute pitch, the elevator pitch, it is important. Who are you speaking to, and what do you want from that pitch? What are you trying to get from that person? And you're gonna adjust your pitch accordingly. Does that make sense? So if it's someone that you're looking to raise capital from, you might see something very differently than it's someone you want to work for you. See the difference or partner? Okay, the idea of a Gantt chart is that you have tasks that simultaneously run. And so you want to understand when things are running because you can't do this until maybe you have certain things that you need from here done or whatever. So each thing can be interrelated, but it allows you to do more than one thing at one time. So as you're thinking about a timetable, like I often say, well, when do you want to be in market? Or when do you want whatever? And then you're like, okay, great, let's assume that. Now let's walk, work back and say, what do we need to do to make that happen? And then you put it down in a timetable and you ideally give a cushion because inevitably there's Murphy. Everyone knows who Murphy is? Murphy's, Murphy's law. Yeah, what's Murphy's law? Anything that can't happen wrong. Yeah, and it's typically what can go wrong can, exactly. It will go wrong. Yeah, so, it, so the more experience you have, the more you can prevent a Murphy, all right? And the more that you put extra time in and you try and manage things, you can minimize those negative things and have better control over your business and moving forward in a professional and positive, efficient, hopefully profitable way. Okay, so the where is also really important because you might want to start in one place but then expand somewhere else or you might want to um, you know, scale up at some point. So you need to think about that because even though you're starting with this or with this, you need to be thinking longer term, what are you planning to do? And it will influence your choices. It will influence what you're willing to invest in different things, all right? Like this morning, I have a client in Australia and we're working on her branding. 
for a Vietnamese restaurant. And it may not end up being a Vietnamese restaurant, but with her branding, the key point we we're talking about is she's in this one location she's going to be introducing in Perth. Okay, it's a very wealthy upscale area, but and she just wants her brand though to be something that can be um, eventually international. So she shouldn't just be, for example, looking at competition that's in her little Perth area. She needs to be thinking about the concept bigger and understanding where she's going to be competing in the future. Does this make sense? So as you're doing these things, everything's interrelated. Okay. Um, so the how, there's this thing called theory of change. Who's heard of theory of change? All right. It's basically an if-then. You probably did if-thens in your life when you were doing school projects or papers or whatnot. If this happens, then that. So what action you take and what resources, and we talked about money, but there's other resources. It's time, it's people, and so forth. Cause the desired role. So how do you make it happen? So this input and these activities causes this. And that causes this, which then causes that. So for each of you, if you want to add something more to your homework, I don't know if you want it or not. Do you want to add more to your homework? Yes? Let's do it. Yeah. I would say, write this sentence down, this equation. Inputs to activities, to outputs, to outcomes, to impact. And then see what you want to put down under each of these. Maybe if you know Excel, put those as the headings on the top, leaving the first column blank, and then put something over here of what, what do you want. And like work your way through them and see. And maybe you start in reverse. Maybe you say, here's the impact I want, and then what do I need to do in order to get there? I like that oh, sorry. Um, you're explaining it. Could you just um, give an example of what you did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Put me on the spot, why don't you? Oh, All right. right. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I'll actually, I'd actually like to do it with someone in the room because it'll be more interesting for everyone. So who, who hasn't really spoken yet would like to participate and try and figure this out? Okay. So you were doing the biotech, was it? It was, uh, okay. okay. So let's just go for it. So, just, I, well, I, we, have I, 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 we have a summer school international. We have 30 people who are blind, and we ask for a fee. And a fee for the blind we, uh, people to have the fee. Yeah, for five weeks, summer school, uh, $1,700 for an undergraduate student. Let's That's keep it focused. Yeah. What impact do you want to have? Or do you want to start with inputs? Which way are we going? I'm not very really sure what input, what you make of any input. Inputs are going to so. be what resources you have that can help you achieve certain things. So you don't have money, but you want money. I did not use any money because we didn't have a budget. I just asked for a fee. Okay. So we already made. Okay. So the yeah. input. One yes. of your inputs yeah. is that you have a fee that's being charged to each student. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And that, that fee is going to get what activity? The activity is the various people teaching the students various courses. And then the output is the students then learn A, B, C. And they get a certificate. Of and as a result of that certificate and that learning, how are they going to be better? Or if they go improve? back to their countries, I have seven from outside the U.S., the professionals, and uh, they cannot have enough money to study here for a master's degree in biotics, which is very expensive. So they go back, and some of them they are teaching, or some of them they are in research. So then they teach others, and so they exactly. impact spreads. So that's a wonderful that's a, example. And, and we so would we like also them, because some of the professors who are teaching, let's say surgeons, they're also involved with some NGOs. Okay, I, think we need, I apologize because yeah. okay. we were short right. time. So that's but right. what, that was a great example. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so everyone heard how we took a small fee and training to yeah. help students become more capable, uh, or whoever was there didn't necessarily yeah. students, to then go back and start to do it with others, which was then like this sort of spreading out where hopefully more and more are doing it to have the end impact that was desired. So it's like your um, your action steps to yes. your mission statement. That's what this is. It's it's the how are you going to get from here to here. Exactly. Okay. Okay, good job. So, the so the how is through a program like ours. That's one how. Okay. There's many hows. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for each of you, you can figure out how many hows. So you're thinking about your impact. You're thinking about what do you want. 
tying it to your mission, setting some goals and objectives, and then starting to say, how are we going to make it happen? And it could include partnerships too. So um, one of the topics that I was asked to talk about is marketing, and I'm, I'm going to keep it simple. A lot of people don't really appreciate the value of marketing. Raise your hand if you kind of feel like, oh, you know, I already have something so great, why do I need to market it? You know, shouldn't people know about it? I think I was very bad in marketing, and I, I made a lot, I have no idea about marketing. Okay, I was just so, so intuitively. Thank you. Yeah, and marketing is, is extremely important. So I, I want to share just a little story. Okay, Joshua Bell. Who knows Joshua Bell? Okay. Um, who's Joshua Bell? He's a violinist. Violinist. Okay. He's a really famous violinist. He's considered one of the, you know, best musicians in the world. He's played all over, you know, to kings, you know, and so on. Anyway, Joshua Bell was part of an experiment. He went to play in uh, Washington, D.C. Metro many years ago. Yeah. And when he played, he played on a $3 million Stradivarius violin. Okay. And he played exquisitely. He normally makes, um, oh, what was it, like $1,500 or something? No, no, $115,000, I think it was, some very large sum, <laughs> doing, doing a big difference, doing a, um, a concert, all right? And here he is, and there's no sign saying who he is. He's wearing a baseball cap. You know, it's a busy place. Some people, the kids especially, stop as they're going by with their families. Um, and he's beautifully playing the most exquisite music with his body into it. And you would think, he's so amazing. Of course people would appreciate it because it's so beautiful. And he's one of the best. But in total, he made less than $50. It was like something like $34 or something during the 40 minutes he was there. And only one person recognized him because she had seen him uh, playing you know, the night before in um, Washington, D.C. So what does this story say? It says, what do you think it says? What does it say to you? What does it say to you, for example? Uh, it says he needs to do a little bit better marketing, right? He should be recognizable, I think. Um. OK, what else? Yes, and then yes? I think about um, the lack of visibility, because maybe he initially thought that he needed to blend in so he wouldn't stand out so much so that he would appeal to the masses. But in trying to blend in with a baseball cap and such, he cut the appeal of him being one of the world's finest, you know, and he would have made more money. But not only that, that visibility is what attracts and invites people because whether it was the music or the way he soulfully plays music or whatever the case may be, it needs to resonate with the audience. And right. Thank yeah. you. One, one more and then we'll actually. I think it's no matter how great you are, how fabulous you are. No one else knows about it. You mean nothing. Right. It's a perceived value. It's perceived. It's like the idea of a tree falls in the forest. Did it really fall? It did. If no one knows, even though it's there and it did happen, no one knows. So I like to simplify marketing into three words. What do you think those three words might be? Get out there. Okay, I like that. <laughs> okay, what Always else? Always be selling. Always be closing. <laughs> Always be closing. <laughs> It's true. Wall if you don't Street. do anything, no one knows. In his case, he wasn't properly packaged. Yeah. There was no signage. There was nothing to communicate anything. So the three words that I use to describe marketing is awareness, trial, and repeat. And this is the whole basis for your entire marketing plan, in my opinion. Awareness of what? What do you want people to say about you? Right? To whom do you want to say it? What do you want them to experience? What's your brand voice? So how are you going to say it? So people don't know you exist, even though you're right there in front of them, like Joshua Bell was. You don't have a business. Once you get them to know who you are, and you properly package yourself, because you all agree, he, he wasn't. He, it was where his this example that was done was to prove that even if you're the best, well, people appreciate art and beauty if it's there. The assumption might have been, and the hypothesis that was tested, is if something is really amazing, will people appreciate it where you don't have to tell them? And that clearly said no, which means that everyone here, you really believe in what you're doing. You have a great social cause, or you have a great whatever it is that you're doing, but unless people know about it and you tell them, it's not going to happen. You're not going to get what you want, and you're not going to help people the way you want to help them. 
So you need to think about what is it you need to communicate, how you want to be perceived, and then how do you get someone to try you the first time. And you might have a whole program. It could be a different type of sampling program. It could be an experience that you give away at a lower price point. You know, there's lots of ways you can do the trial. And then the repeat is you want them to come back again and again. Because if people don't come back again and again, whatever, whoever your target audience is or whatever, you really don't have a business. Because there's no volume in there. There's no life long time. Okay, so here's another quote, Amy. Okay. Um, so the biggest tackle for me is, or biggest issue, um, is consumer education, how to distill the most important, relevant, and engaging parts of my business. Okay, good. So when we think back, what were the three words I said were important for marketing, the essence of marketing? Awareness, trial, and repeat. Good, awareness, trial, and repeat. What does this have to do with? Awareness. Awareness, yeah. And knowing what to include in what you want to make people aware of. And this is really important. Because if you say too much or you say too little or you don't say things that people care about. So I actually did a, a last summer for the Fancy Food Show, I did a, um, a, a, I like, I ran a panel on pitching to the press. And I learned a lot. And then I did it as an online course. And um, it was great. I had the editor-in-chief of Bon Appetit magazine, the creative director of O, and the uh, edit, the editor-in-chief of Tasting Table, who's now editor-in-chief of Savoir. So here were three amazingly dynamic people, all right, who had a wealth of experience. And what were some of the things they shared? They shared, clearly to me, I've always thought what's new is really important. So when you're reaching out to people, people always want to know what's new, right? It, it stops them. What's the new movie that's about to come out? What's the new book? What's the new store that's about to open? The new restaurant, right? Doesn't that excite you a little bit? When you're on the phone trying to sell to someone, because some of you are asking questions about selling, so being able to say what's new, you know, really gets someone right up front. It grabs their attention. Then it's up to you to do that elevator pitch to get them to buy into what you're saying. And you want to shift your elevator pitch to the person, customize it to the person you're targeting. Does that make sense? Because as I said earlier, someone who's a banker or an investor is going to get a different pitch than someone you want as a partner versus someone you're trying to sell to, versus someone that you're asking for help from, and so on. Okay, so knowing what is, this word is extremely important, what's relevant. So you need to think about who is it that you're speaking to, and then what do they care about? And that was one of the essences that they talked about, um, is who cares? So like, I think it was Adam Rappaport of Bon Appetit said, um, and he has a wicked sense of humor, yeah, so he's like, send, who, why are you, I'm sorry, Adam, whoops, no, I may have said it wrong. I apologize. Um, Adam, <laughs> I think it was the Bon Appetit, said about, um, why are, why is someone sending me diapers? Oh, I think it was, it was Adam Glassman of, oh, he says, why is someone sending me diapers? We don't put diapers in a magazine, right? Why would that, why would someone do that? They haven't done their due diligence. They haven't properly matched up what I write to and what the audience is, to what we care about. So every time you think about reaching out to the media or you think about reaching out to someone, you have to think about what do they care about? What's important to them? All right, the so what factor. That's a great way to describe it. So as Amy, in answer to this, as you're thinking about it, think about what does someone care about? What's the so what factor? What's new? Everyone always loves new. What's tied into trends? That's also relevant. Okay, and then think about that audience and what do they really care about? What, and what you can do is you can test it in different ways. Okay. Um, so I also want to try and simplify making money in business. And I know some of you are not in business to make money. So instead, think about this brief subject as you still need to raise capital in terms of grants or funds or whatever to be able to run your business, even though it's a not-for-profit or a non-profit. And you need to pay your expenses. If you have people that are working for you, you might have to pay them. If you have an office space, you might have to pay for it, um, and so on and so forth, right? So everyone, in a sense, needs to think about this subject. <coughs> All right. So a lot of people think, oh, just make, you know, raise more money or sell more product, right, is the way that you make money in business. But that's not true. First of all, you want to make sure that your foundation is really solid. All right? You need to make sure that what you're doing is working. And for everyone in general, I always say start small. 
even when you're starting something new within an already existing business. Start small, test, be willing to adjust it, okay? Um, learn from your experience what's working and not working. Make sure that things are done the right way. So part of your foundation has to do with these basic financial ideas. The idea of revenue and expenses would be for everyone, but I'm focusing this on the not-for-profits more so in nonprofits. Revenue means sales or income or any money coming in for everybody. And expenses are what's going out. So typically, revenue coming in is accounts receivables, all right, and expenses going out are accounts payables. So if you have revenue going up, but your expenses are also going up, you might end up where you're not making any money and you're in fact losing more money even though you had more money coming in. So where are the monies allocated and what you do with it is really important, okay? When it comes to a for-profit business, it's volume and margin. So it's not just selling more, but the margin is one of the most important things first. So I'm gonna talk a moment about it. Does everyone here understand gross profit margin? Raise your hand if you don't. Because gross profit margin is extremely important. So really fast, you know, it's the difference between your cost of goods sold and your revenue. So if you take that gross profit off the top of your business, um, of your P&L, like and divide by revenue, get your gross profit margin. And by doing that, you have an idea of how much do you make on every sale. And the reason this is important is because that's where you have the opportunity to make more money out of your business. Because if you can increase your margin, that means on every sale you make, no matter what it is you're in doing, you're gonna make more money per sale. So there's a couple ways you can do that. One is top down, which is you look at your pricing and you say, how can I bring my price down um, or how can I raise my price up? <laughs> what will the market bear in order for me to sell more? And you can do other things. You can reduce sizes of things, you can change materials. There's lots of ways to bring your cost down. And that's the bottom up, which is where you try and say, okay, I need at least this much in order to you know, make money in this business, and so you do that, and hopefully you're gonna find that there's money between. So I'm gonna briefly, oh, and so, and then I'm gonna come back to that. So in terms of improving your margin, a way to think is to bring your costs down or to bring your prices up. That's an obvious way of thinking. So what I wanna do is give you an example for reducing costs. When I was at Kraft General Foods, one of my, I was in bird's eye vegetables, which I felt good because it was all natural and so forth, and one of my lines, well, one of my products within, within that line was mixed vegetables, all right? And at that time, mixed vegetables had lima beans, carrots that were diced, corn kernels, peas, and shortcut green beans. And I was looking to say, how can I manage my line? There's a term called line management, and I was looking within a, this specific product, and I realized that the lima beans were really expensive. I think they were more expensive than all the other ingredients combined, and I thought, Wow, that was internally looking at the cost of goods sold. Externally, I thought, a lot of people don't like lima beans. Most people like who are buying this are, are mothers who want to have their kids eat vegetables, all right? So if the kids are complaining to say they don't want to eat the lima beans, why do we have the lima beans in this product that everyone has the lima beans in? Everyone else was doing it, right? So everyone agreed, we have choices. Once again, choices. Our choices were, keep it as is, or change it. Within change it, it was take them all out or reduce the percentage. And I said, let's just take them out. But remember when I talked about clearly defined roles and responsibilities, accountability and communication, I needed to communicate it to the consumer. So on the front of each label, we wrote, look ma, no limas. So we made it in a fun way. The mothers and the consumers didn't look at lima beans as having a higher nutrient value, would be nutrient denser rich. It was like it's a vegetable. And if they can get their kids to eat all the other four vegetables, they're thrilled instead of the kids complaining. So think of the lima bean as a metaphor for ego. What in your business is your lima bean? What in your business do you have there because you think you want it, but maybe you can pull the expenses out? And I'd like you to really put it on your list of homework too. What are the lima beans in your business? <laughs> okay, so these two we just talked about. You can increase your selling price, it's one method too. But overall, your, your key intention is to work on improving your margins, all right? And 
Another option for how you can improve your margin, remember we said if you're, you're priced higher but your costs are the same, <coughs> your margin goes up. If you're priced hot, if you keep your price but your costs go down, your margin goes up. But another thing is to shift what you're doing. So within what you have, you could focus on what's more profitable. All right? And there's ways then to better market the things that are more profitable so that your total business overall will be more financially viable. Does this make sense? Okay. So when you're increasing volume, you have options. You have a lot of options. One is in terms of what you're offering, the number of items. So um, you can increase your current offerings by um, selling in more accounts, selling more in the same accounts, selling in new geographies, selling to different channels. You know, there's lots of options. And also you can offer new products or new services or whatever. Those are ways to make money. But in terms of what you're doing, it's all an ongoing process. And remember before when I was talking about communication and you know meeting on a formal basis weekly to say, hey, how are we doing? These are the kinds of things you want to think about. What's working and not? What can I or we do better? Always ask, what can we do better? All right? And then how can you also, you should always be thinking about how can you bring costs down while improving quality? So I don't say bring costs down just for the sake of bringing costs down. You don't want to like pull out the quality of what you're doing. But on the other hand, you want to say, is some of that quality that I think is quality, maybe the line of being in my business. And if I pull it out, I'm going to be creating better value to the consumer. My sales shot up, our sales shot up with the mixed vegetables, for example. We were the first to do it. Today I have to go and check and see if our lima beans still in mixed vegetables. No. I thought it was only corn and peas. All right. Well, they, they even further cost reduce, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So um, this was another one. Tina. Is Tina here? Hi, Tina. Can you share your your issue? Getting more sales, buying a newer game is riskier. Okay. So I I love that you wrote this because. The word risk is really important. Risk is like one of those themes I love to talk about. Because risk is what prevents people from doing things. All right? Risk is what costs you more. Like if you're looking for a bank loan or an investor and they perceive you having a lot of risk, you're going to end up giving more away than if you're more established and you're able to prove what you're doing has a higher chance of succeeding. You don't need to give as much away. So risk, risk is where, you know when you go into a store and they have, a, let's say it's food, and you get to sample something. By sampling it, you get awareness because you stop and you look. Then you get trial because you're tasting it. And then what happens is you start to, without even realizing it maybe, think about the value of the offer. And value is extremely important in marketing. The value is a subliminal thing you're thinking about, which is about the relationship between what it costs and what it's worth it to you. What it's worth it to you includes things like the taste, the packaging, which we talked about in terms of Joshua Bell. It includes things like the experience, where you are. You expect like to spend a lot more for something in a high-priced venue that's got the beautiful music and the, you know, all the extra decor and ambiance versus, you know, a lower-end place that doesn't have that, that's a quick turning place. All right? So your value perception. So being able to manage risk is really important. And the ways to manage risk is to get awareness, to get trial, and to have a value that's worthwhile. So things that reduce risk in your case might be things like getting an award. If there's awards for games, which there are, and you're, oh, I'm sorry, and you're, yeah. okay. It has, and okay. it does help. I agree so taking, things. I'm gonna continue. Yeah. Having an award though, let's say that award is once again the Joshua Bell story. If no one knows you have that award, it's still just playing for nothing. Okay, so it's, it's getting the recognition, getting like people, like the reason that the award is valuable is it's, an ex, it's a third party acknowledgement that this is good, therefore it's worth taking the risk to purchase this. So the more third party acknowledgements you're getting, in a sense it's like saying it's okay. Social media also is a great way to do that. When like-minded people who are in circles like something, then it just keeps fanning out in a way. So there's there's different techniques to reduce risk and to build awareness and to gain that trial and then get the repeat. Um, so the fact that it's newer, instead of that being a negative, and it's true there are traditional games that everyone wants, you know, whether it's Monopoly or Scrabble or Boggle or whatever, um, 
The advantage, though, is there's some that take off. So what you need to do is figure out what is it about this game that's really interesting and appealing. The people who love it, why do they love it? And then you have a lot of choices for how to go forward. You could use those people as influencers and have them recommend it to others and build it out slowly. You can use public relations and the media as a means to try and build awareness because part of the issue is people don't know what this is. And so it's a risk as long as they don't appreciate the value. Once someone appreciates the value, then it's less risky. Does that make sense at all? Sure. So for everyone here in your own businesses, because each of these really apply to everyone here, is think about what's your value proposition. How do people perceive you? What causes someone to hesitate to, to get involved in whatever it is your, your social cause is, or your business is, or your offering is? And then find ways to help them to learn about it in a way where there's confidence building so the risk goes down, where there's trials so the risk goes down. Because let's say, okay, you get the idea. So the next slide is about why you need financials. And this we've already sort of talked about, about the roadmap, you know, in terms of the same reason you do a business plan is the financial section is part of the business plan, but it's all the same reasons. You know, you need to know how much capital do you need? How much do you have? So sources and uses is where is the money coming from and where is it going, all right? Your profit and loss statement is saying what do you project as your sales or your revenue coming in from whatever sources, and then what does it cost you to, to do whatever you need to do in order to, to get that revenue, to, that's your cost of goods sold, to get to that, net, that gross profit. And then everything below there is what are you spending to keep your business going, you know, um, and so on. So, you need to know what those are because you need to plan for them. And uh, you, it helps you manage things because if you know, let's say you're going across the country, as we gave the example, if you don't have enough money to pay for gas when you're driving that car, you're gonna, right? And if you don't, um, you, you, you wanna stay in certain places but you can't afford them, you're gonna have problems and you wanna have a contingency. What if your car, like for example, breaks down and all of a sudden you need to replace the tire? It wasn't in your budget, right? There's a startup budget and an operating budget and a business plan. The startup budget, who knows what a startup budget is? What's, uh, someone who hasn't spoken yet? If not, thank you. What's the uh, startup the budget? budget is? is kind of the launch pad. That is the money that it takes you to initially get to the point where you can sell your first product exactly. or give your first service. Exactly. So it's, it's the capital needed prior to your first sale. Perfect or the day you open and something. What's the operating budget from that point? The operating budget is the day-to-day, -day, week to week, quarter to quarter, money that you need to operate your business for the present and the future. Right, and it, it starts though after Sorry, the start. after the startup. So, so basically it's like- startup costs, and exactly. then the first sales, and then like Very if you good. have a quarter to quarter of the year, you see what you operate, you need it for the year to right. operate. So it's really important because if you don't have enough, then you have to have a contingency plan. Mm -hmm. And for everyone here, have you all heard about sensitivity analyses? Do you know what a sensitive, okay. All right, no, you're doing a great I job. It. I mean, I, you're doing a great I'm job. I'm gonna use that real quick, so. I'm oh. gonna let you do it. Okay, yeah. so the idea of a sensitivity analysis is that what you think might happen, first of all, is probably not gonna really happen. So you need to say what ifs. What if sales are 10% less than I thought? What if expenses are 10% more? And you're gonna to start to see what happens in your numbers. It's basically looking at different scenarios so that you have an understanding of what's gonna, what could happen so that you can plan accordingly. That's the concept of a sensitivity analysis. All right, so it's your roadmap and it helps you manage, it helps you, sure. It's, I've now been seeing this uh, that 10% is a standard for, you know, the um, startup budget for the sensitivity analysis. Oh, I don't, I do would not say one? only 10%. Okay, what do you think? I think the key is that you understand how sensitive your business is to different variables. Okay. Season of, so season if of. you, and, and also, I mean, things can go really far off. So another thing is the break-even analysis. So. That's the point in time when you're no longer, when the money that you paid for the startup, all those initial expenses are paid off. And when you're starting to now make a profit, okay? That's a really important point too to be looking at and seeing how that changes. Because that break even point is a point in time. And if that's 12 years from now, you might be like, 
that's too long. And so you need to say, where are the lima beans? What do I need to take out and bring back? And I'll share a quick story. Um, I teach a course also called What I Wish I Knew Before Starting My Business. Okay, it's a great course. And I bring in different guest speakers. And um, I once had Amy of Amy's Breads, and uh, she was wonderful. And what she talked about is when she wrote her initial business plan, she had a vision and a, a very large idea of what she wanted. And all the investors said, scale it back. That's too much. We can't start that. And it goes back to what I said earlier about starting small and testing. And so what she ended up doing is she ended up scaling it down. And um, she got her investments. And she started with one small place. And when she came in to speak, it was actually on the anniversary of her business, a mini anniversary. And she said that um, you know she wanted to get back. But she said that her business plan, about, she said that where she was on the day that she came in to speak to everyone, uh, it was for a due school, University Food Studies program. Um, when she came in and she spoke, she said her business plan that she'd originally written is where she was today. But that it, it's taken so long to get there. But she got where she wanted. And it was really cool. It was really nice to hear. So as you're looking at your financials, don't forget about being smart, as we talked about. Um, your actions cost money, and you need to think about every choice you make, there's a financial impact by that choice. There's a time impact, all right? There's a personnel impact. So as you're working on your plans, think about who's going to do what and when. Like, go back to that who, what, why, when, where, and how. And, you know, think about your growth, too, and where you want to be longer term. Because you don't want to end up where you're starting this and then you're flat. On the other hand, you might say, well, at that point, I'm going to try and bring other people in. So what you're trying to do is build a situation in your businesses where the risk appears to be less, where you're shown that you've done success with something. So like that Amy story I just mentioned about Amy's friends, the idea that she brought it back to something small and doable that she could prove gave, and it also caused her to change what she did a bit. So when I say she was at the same place, she was in the sense of multiple places, doing wholesale, doing retail doing this, that, and the other. But for example, she wasn't thinking of doing sandwiches, but having that first place helped her learn that's what people wanted. They didn't just want the loaves of bread. They wanted value-added products, which she could make more money on as well, that were going to be convenient because people wanted to eat on, you know, to go and whatnot. And then eventually, you know, eat at the other. So thinking in the future. And then that allows you, your financials also allow you to, um, reduce the risk and help other people understand what you're trying to accomplish and buy into your idea, your vision, your mission, and your business or your cause, okay? So that's one of the reasons, because people typically want, you know, to make sure. Okay, Gail. Hi, Gail. Hello. Um, limited access to capital and resources. Okay. So. There's always going to be limited access just about, unless you need the money. When you don't need the money, it's hard to get the money, all right? I'm sorry. When you don't need the money, it's easier to get the money. When you, when you really need it, that's usually when it's harder, okay? So the key is for everyone to maybe build relationships with people early on who in the future might be able to help you in some way. So for example, I used to teach a class on how to write a great business plan. And I would bring in someone who was a banker. And she said that everyone should, there's a couple things they could do up front. And one of them was to build a relationship with someone in the bank. So that when it came time to get a bank loan, you know, if they know you, they'll vouch for you. Because character is one of the, the variables that's considered. All right. Um, she also said about checking your credit rating. Has everyone here done that already in this class? Have you talked about that? Where everyone should be, okay, good. So you should make sure and clean it up if you have any issues, because that also could influence things. Um, it all has to do with your risk factor. If you can't properly manage your own money, it's going to be people assume then how can you manage your business money and why should they invest money in something where the money's not going to be properly managed. So having limited access, you need to figure out why do you have limited access? Is it that you just haven't sought it or is it that when you seek it and you speak to people, they say no? Those are two different issues. So which is it? And then I'll try and address the one that I is. I the first one, not seeking. Not seeking it. Okay. Going with the idea first. Okay. So not seeking it is the same thing of, you know, nothing's going to happen if you don't do it. <laughs> so you got to try it. But in order to do it, you want to do it professionally and do it the right way. So you can test it. Just like um, before we started tonight, there was like, you know, practicing pitching. It's a good idea to practice. And you, you want to know 
how much you're asking for is very important, and how is it going to be used, and how are you going to pay it back if it's to be paid back? All right, those are really important, and people don't like to be told, you know, here's my, you know, business, here's what I'm doing, how much can I get? No one wants to hear that. They want to know that there's a specific amount and that it's going to be used for something specifically, and it should be something that matches like-mindedly what they're doing. So um, I was recently at an event where someone was sharing their uh, request for capital as a way to explain you know, what they were doing on an issue they had. And in it, it was like 85% of the money being asked for was going to be used for G&A, which is not something that's going to grow the business. It's more paying for people or whatever. But it was like administrative stuff. And the response immediately was, why is someone going to give their money to like pay you and pay that? That's not where the, their money's not doing anything. I mean, this is as an investor versus as a bank. For the bank, they care about getting paid back with interest, and they want to make sure you can do that. So it depends on, so stepping back a moment, what you need to figure out is how much do you think you need, and maybe go for a little bit more because you might need more, and then um, how are you going to use it? If you got even more, sometimes people will ask you, if I gave you more, <coughs> How much, what would you do differently? How much quicker could you actually accomplish what you're trying to accomplish? And they might in fact be interested if it's something that ties into other things. All right? Okay, um, so a mere conclusion here. In terms of financial planning, we sort of talked a little bit about these. The sources is where you're getting the money from, all right? Uh, and it could be your own, it could be family and friends, it could be grants and sponsors or whatnot. The uses is where is it going, and that goes forward. And then forecasting is really important. Um, and there's lots of ways to forecast. But forecasting can be based on history, where you project from that, or other people's. But you need to just break something down in a simple way. So who here has had trouble forecasting sales? I'm going to take a minute or two. OK. All right. So just in one sentence, tell me what are you selling again that you are, you know. I'm selling uh, rabbits a lot, but they have unique features. OK. And who is a client that you're selling to, for example? All clients are small businesses. Everybody who has a uh, um, single stall or public restaurant. Medical offices, uh, restaurants, okay. libraries. So, so what, there's lots of ways to project sales. And the more that you actually have started selling, you've already sold 700 locks? No, I sold uh, almost 2,000. 2,000, uh, um, OK. The problem, it's not lots, it's, uh, yeah, 700 companies. 700 companies. Okay. So what that says is the average company takes less than three years locks. Ago, I'm sorry. I tried uh, to do the forecast like three years ago when it okay. just was starting the So product. for everyone here, when you're doing a forecast, you need to make assumptions. And then you can test your assumptions and say how realistic it is of it. So at this point, in three years, you have 700 companies and you've sold 2,000 locks. Okay. So in six months, thank you, it's our first time meeting. <laughs> in six, I read a paragraph, you know, when, when Becca first sent me something a while ago. Okay, so you, you, in six months, you've sold 700 companies, and that's a total of 2,000 locks. So looking at a big picture, which is not the best way to look at it, because you need to look underneath those numbers to see what's really going on. But if I just look at a big picture, I would say on average, you're selling a little less than three locks per account, right? So that's one assumption I might make. But the thing is, my gut says different accounts aren't going to be like that. So just like you have an average, you then also have a median, right? So the average is, you know, you add up all the numbers and where does it fit in the center? But the reality is you might have an account that buys 100, and then you might have, you know, 100 accounts that only buy one. So what you need to do is segment them and forecast the segments. Okay, in my opinion, if I want to have more accurate, and I, I'm very into trying to get as accurate as possible. Um, once again, for everyone here, don't have fear of these numbers, don't have fear of the forecasting, because it can't be a real, real number, because you don't have a bowl that allows you to see into the future, all right? So you can just do the best you can. So you try and make the best assumptions you can. So you have one option to say it's like 2.9 or whatever that number is, locks per count, but then if you start to break it down, Look at your 700 you've sold too far and break them down into how many did I sell to stores, how many did I sell to restaurants, how many. And on average, when I sell to a restaurant, how many did I buy? On average, when I sell to, you know, whatever, whatever, each of these different types of accounts, what do they buy? 
And then within those, you can say, gee, there's some really large accounts. So while I can say a restaurant only buys one or two, there's two bathrooms, there's actually a lot of restaurant chains. And if I were to target restaurant chains, then I'm going to have a lot more locks on sell, and so on and so forth. And what you then start to do is you can build it bottom up or top down. Bottom up could be, all right, how do I forecast? Well, I'm the only one doing sales, if that's the case. Or I have distributors who can sell for me. Or I'm going to be at trade shows. You know, each of these factors influences how you make assumptions about what you think you're capable of selling. Is this making sense so far? So as you're thinking about it, like let's say you're going to go to a trade show that's, let's say, the hospitality show. Like right now in Chicago, there's the restaurant show. All right? If you were there, you'd be meeting a lot of people who are potentially going to purchase from you. And you're going to also be meeting distributors. And maybe you say, I'm willing to sell. I, I can afford. My margin allows me to sell through a distributor. That's going to affect your sales. If you can't afford to sell through a distributor, you can only sell direct. That's going to affect your sales. It's not only going to affect how much you make per sale, but it's also going to affect how many you can sell. So these are some of the variables. And then you make assumptions for each of these. Are you following what I've been saying? Yeah, following. So is there any like uh, guidance, like uh, reading yeah. books about it? Um, sh I, I, I could try and help you. Multi-level marketing, you make it, make it a way. Okay, so basically, if you have distributors and let's say they're sales reps, right, then it'll be easier for you so if you going knocking on the door and getting people to buy the product, the distributors can sell it for you and they get a percentage of the money. Usually a distributor, right. usually you give a discount, and, and if you want, I can talk to you more about this afterwards, right. just because I want to make sure we finish on time. But a distributor typically gets a different price than a wholesaler, right. than a retailer, and there's yeah. different prices depending on who's using it. So if you're selling privacy locks to a private person in a home, you're going to sell it at full retail price, versus unless they buy in quantity, because you might have quantity discounts. If you're selling to a distributor, they're typically going to get a percentage off of what a store would pay for it or, you know, because they're selling it to the store, so they're middlemen, so they have to pay less than whoever is, like, using it from a business standpoint. And so each of those are different prices, you make different amounts on them, but the, hopefully the upside is you sell more volume when you're working with others. So choices for everyone here are you need to think about, for whatever you're doing, are you first of all doing it yourself or are you bringing in others? How much can you personally do? And then you can actually write a list of target accounts in your business plan that you're going to go after and create a plan. Just like we did that Gantt timetable, you can say, okay, every day I'm going to call two people or every whatever it is you're going to do or visit or whatever. And then that's how, and then you start to say, each time I do that, around how many come to fruition. If every time you go in it comes to fruition, that gives you a sense of what it is, you know, by segment. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful. All right. Um, Burn rate is something to think about too with your numbers, is how quickly is your money going to go? And you need to think about that so you don't run out of money too quickly. And then where can you get money in the future if it's not just you know from sales, if you need to raise capital for other purposes? This is a um, site, and, and we can email this to you, um, but for everyone here, if you go on the SCORE site, SCORE is, smart of the, <laughs> SCORE is part of the Small Business Administration, and they provide free assistance. Um, and they also have all the financial statement templates available for free online. So it's just a free place you can go and they have sample business plans. What is it? Financial statements? It's like, score.org slash resources no, backslash that. business planning and then a dash financial statements template gallery. Okay, I see. So financial statement, it's always part of your business plan and it's actually going to talk about the, not everything that you she just finished talking so about it's just like forecasting. Mm -hmm. So each is like an Excel spreadsheet yeah. with things that are blank in there that you can fill in and it's set up in a way so the formulas are already there. Yeah. So it makes it easier. But you want to customize it. Yeah. Don't just copy. Customize and do what's right for your business. Because what's right for your business is not what's right for yours or yours as well. And sit down with these and Okay, so <laughs> in conclusion, we're really close to the end. Um, for projecting your future, you know, you need to be thinking about there's some things you have control. If you know in life, some things you have control over and some things you don't, right? Yeah. But you need to try and plan for it. So there's things you can plan, you know, when you're projecting. And we just sort of started talking about that in terms of what are you offering? How many offerings you have is going to influence how many choices you have. You have sales on each of those. So if you have new offerings coming in, that's going to add to your pipeline for future projections or new locations or new whatever it is you're doing. 
Um, the selling prices you select are variables for how you're doing your projections. So if you have different selling prices, like we just talked about, let's say you have a retail price and a wholesale price and a distributor price, then you're going to have a different amount of sales on each, and then you're going to multiply it out by those prices and then add those up, and you'll get your total sales, all right? Um, the maximum capacity, you know, what can you actually do? If you know there's a maximum that you're able to do, you know your sales can't exceed that unless you then find a way to in increase your capacity again by using other people or other places or whatever. Okay. Um, things you don't have control, but you need to think about because it, it should be in your plan too when you're projecting is things like traffic or the economy, what people like. So a lot of you are doing fashion. You know, how quickly are things seasonal? Do they come in and out? Or are your things year-round? You know, climate changes can affect things, you know? So those are things to think about, just as examples. But as you're thinking about the future, you should be looking both internally and externally, what you can control, what you can't control, and how that affects things. Um, this, uh, this is, I think, one of the last slide. And this one is about the idea that you need to think about the key things to manage. So there's a list of things that are the top reasons businesses fail. And this is turned into, instead, a positive way of looking at them. All right, to say instead, yeah, cash flow and not having enough money are big issues for everyone. So instead, you here, as you know, professionals, are going to think about how can I manage my cash flow? How can I make sure that I'm properly capitalized? How can I make sure that I'm properly pricing so that I also have a good margin so that I'm making money on every sale? Because a lot of times, people do not include all their costs and their cost of goods sold, and they, and they don't understand why they're never making money. <laughs> okay, um, There's business things you need to do. You're all here working on business plans. That's great. Um, we talked about not being too optimistic, um, getting help when you need it, when you don't know something. And experience is also really valuable. So when I mentioned, for example, about starting small and testing and learning, that's that, and even with Amy learning that sandwiches were a viable option that she hadn't thought about. In terms of marketing, if no one knows you're there, you're not. So you need to know what it is that you're marketing, to whom are you marketing it, who's your core audience, and then you need to get out and let them know. Get the awareness, get the trial, get the repeat. Um, understanding what your competition doing is also extremely important. That's a whole subject in itself. Um, diversifying means you know also don't put all your eggs in one basket. So you should be thinking and testing different things to see what works for you. So just like I've been saying throughout this evening about what works and doesn't, how can you do better? It's the same thing in your marketing, okay? And then also with people. Um, one of the things too that's a really common thing today and I really like is the idea um, of cross-training people so that people can do different jobs in the company and fill in for each other when needed. This idea of delegation I talked a little bit about earlier when I talked about things that are repetitive tasks, for example, like it's some administrative task you can delegate to someone else, but there's certain tasks you don't want to. Check signing, for example. Everyone here, make sure you are in charge of the money and you sign the checks, even if you have others helping. If you have a partner, both sign it. I won't tell you all the stories I've heard in business, but I've heard many where people get screwed. Even your favorite friend from childhood who's an accountant can end up having a gambling problem or a drug problem and find ways to take money out of your business. So be careful put in checks and balances, and make sure that um, you sign things. When you hire people too, trust your gut. Make sure they fit the job. Hire with intention and have good communication. And go back to what I said. Clearly define roles and responsibilities, accountability and communication, and it will go a long way. <laughs>